Hello and welcome to part 6 of my George H. Thomas dividing head build. We are getting very close now to completing what Thomas calls the basic head. The only thing really left to do are the ball handles to lock the spindle and the tailstock. I'm going to make these in three parts and the way they are dimensioned on the drawings is not the most helpful. So I've taken the time to draw these out by hand and calculate all of the dimensions I'm going to need. In all cases, the large ball and the shaft are one piece, shown in blue here, and the small ball in pink is separate and will be loctited in place. The threaded spindle will then be fixed into the larger ball. These are all going to be made from pre-prepared blanks, shown in green. I'm going to make all of these blanks first so that I can complete all of the ball turning without removing the tool from the lathe. So let's get those done. After facing, I am setting the length of the ball blank at 20 thou over my final size to ensure I have enough material to complete a fully dimensioned ball. I can then machine the clearance needed for the ball turning tool to run into. In all cases, this groove is quarter inch wide with the diameter at the bottom of the groove being the shaft dimension in question. Finally, as this end piece is to be used as a reference to set the ball turning tool itself, I need to make sure that my diameter has the same 20 thou extra as the end, which means machining to 40 thou oversize. That's one done, so just five more to go. Well here are the six blanks finished and two size, and to turn the balls I will be using my boring head which I have modified for the job. I have made a shaft extension which fits in there, and this can then be slid into a simple tool post mount and adding the handle will allow me to rotate the whole thing by hand. The cutting tool is very simple. It has a 3 16 high speed steel bit. This one is an old centre drill, simply ground at an angle across the top with some clearance ground in at the side so that it doesn't clash with the shaft. And it fits into the boring head just like that. This arrangement does have some drawbacks. In use, the normal adjustment for the depth of cut ends up situated at the bottom of the tool. So I have loctited a grub screw into the back of the bolt so that I can reach it from this side. A full turn of this screw advances the cutter 25 thou, so I will need to carefully judge the amount of cut by feel alone. This isn't much different than using the correct side, as that doesn't have any divisions either. If only I had a dividing head, I could add those. Anyway. Let's get this mounted on the lathe and make a start. The ball turning tool needs to be square and on the centre, so I am just turning a small piece of scrap to use as a reference. Squareness is then set by running the holder up to the chuck. I am now adjusting the height until the cutter falls at the same distance below my test piece as above. With that on centre, the last setting is to centre the tool on the x-axis and the value on the dial noted. This is just done by eye as I can refine this as we progress. With that done, setup is finally complete and I can add the first blank. I need to extend the work to give me a good inch of clearance between the relief groove and the chuck to give the tool space to rotate. And finally, the carriage needs to be set to position, which is done by bringing the tool onto the work from above. And then without adjusting any settings, the carriage is moved to bring the tool up to the end of the work. The carriage can then be locked and the tool completely backed off so that it clears the corners of the work. After that, we are now eventually ready to make some cuts. I'm adjusting the boring head by about a quarter of a turn each pass. This is about 6 thou depth of cut, so 12 thou off diameter. Once I get to the stage where a full cut is being taken from the ball, I can fine tune that X position to completely remove any pip from the end of the work. Although I am only working by feel here with an allen key in the adjustment screw, it is really quite easy to hit the dimensions precisely. Turning to the next flat on the allen key is one sixth of a turn and is roughly nine thou off diameter. And I found that gently applying torque to the key and then stopping at the very first feeling of any movement leads to about half a thou being removed from the diameter of the ball. I mean, it isn't fast, but it is precise. Now this will be the final pass, and with this one finished and to size, I'd best get on to the other five. Here we are at the bench with the six completed balls. I didn't film any of the others as the camera really does get in the way when doing this, but there was nothing new to see apart from having to move the cutter to the next position in the boring head halfway through the 7 16 one. 
They are all to size within half a thou, and it is important that they are within a thou or two, as they will be held in these collets for the next operations. These are made exactly to the dimensions in the book, with the exception of the 5 sixteenths, which isn't listed, but calculating what is needed is not too complicated. These now need cutting, facing to length, and a centre adding for the next step. So let's push on. I'm taking a facing cut here just to square up the sawn end, and then after measuring the length, I can return to the lathe and remove the required amount. I have locked the cross slide, and I'm dialing in the dimension using the top slide. A very small centre drill completes this operation. With that done, it is on to turning the handle itself. I have the ball in the collet. These collets have a witness mark that corresponded to the location of jaw 1 when they were first made. By lining this back up will keep the inevitable run out to a minimum. Now this is not the most rigid of work holding setups, so I have the back end supported by a half centre in the tailstock. I will remove the bulk of the metal using power feed here, but the taper will need to be turned using the top slide alone with the carriage locked. With that material removed, the first dimension feature is the spigot on the end that will take the smaller ball. To dial in this dimension, I am touching off with the tool on the end of the work and setting a carriage stop at that point. I can then dial in my spigot length using the top slide, lock it off and then carry on as normal, power feeding up to the carriage stop. This diameter does need to be on dimension as the fit between this and the hole I will ream in the smaller ball will determine the final strength of that Loctited joint. Next up is the taper itself. I have set the top slide here to about 2.5 degrees, somewhat more than my calculated value, and I have then adjusted the cross slide to be as close to the work as possible, while still allowing me clearance from the tailstock here to manipulate the crank. Now this is all brilliant, but if we look at the tool, I am still a good half an inch away from the smallest diameter on the work so I'm going to have to extend this out of the tool post to reach. This tool is now hanging out somewhere around an inch and a half, which is most certainly excessive, but I think if I keep the depth of cut small, we should be okay. Feed is done with the top slide crank, and depth of cut is being added with the cross slide. I'm only taking 10 thou off diameter per pass here, and I have set the calipers 15 thou over my target diameter for the small end. This means if they don't fit, I can safely take another pass without fear of removing too much material. The greater angle on the top slide also means the taper will run out before reaching the larger ball. Once I'm close to target on the small end, I can blue the part and gently adjust the angle. The blue allows me to see in which direction I need to make further adjustments, if any. A couple of attempts here is all it takes to get this close enough, and if making multiple identical handles, it could remain set for all further parts. It's a shame I'm only making one. A final pass brings me to size, and this will need a little work with 400 grit wet and dry before I can remove it from the lathe. Next up is the small ball. This just needs facing to leave a flat the same size as the small end of the handle, and a hole drilling and reaming to take the spigot. A generous chamfer ensures that the radius at the end of the spigot doesn't prevent the ball from seating correctly. Now I have a nice fit on the handle, but I am not quite deep enough. I have so much time in these that I'm being incredibly careful with every operation, and with that in mind, I'm going to chicken out and shorten the spigot on the handle, rather than risk breaking through the other side of the ball. That is now a lovely fit, and I can turn my attention to machining the bottom of the main ball. The collet design here allows the handle to pivot backwards. I'm just setting this by eye, sighting the spigot against a protractor held against the chuck body. The ball can then be faced to size and drilled and reamed for the threaded shank. And finally this part requires a grub screw through the side to fix the thread. I'm just using a drill bit of the appropriate size to ensure the flat is parallel with the lathe axis, and again I am setting the shaft square by eye. I can then centre drill before drilling and tapping M3. Once again, ensuring the centre drill is deep enough to leave a chamfer finishes the hole nicely. That's all of the work on the handles complete so it is on to the threaded shank. This is marked out using odd leg calipers before turning to 6mm to receive the thread. And although I will be cutting this with a die, I am still machining an undercut because I like the way it looks. M6 is small enough that I can cut the whole thread using a tailstock die holder. There is nothing special about this. After chamfering the end of the work, I am just bringing the unlocked tailstock up to the part 
and allowing the die to pull the tailstock along the bed. Occasional reversal of the lathe to break the chips, and I eventually have a complete thread. A couple of chamfers finish this end. With the part reversed in the chuck, it is now a simple matter of turning down a quarter inch spigot to fit the reamed hole in the handle. I have a good fit there, so let's head over to the bench to see how these look. The shaft looks good, and off camera I have machined a flat onto the spigot here to receive the grub screw in the handle. I worked out where to put this by trial fitting the shaft in the dividing head, and I simply marked the location with a sharpie. The handle itself is assembled and it fits nicely onto the shaft. The small handles are also done. The plans call for a simple straight screw on these, but I've taken the time to make a stepped screw similar to the large one for a couple of reasons, really. Firstly, I think it looks better. And secondly, these handles are held on with Loctite. If the step wasn't there, when tightening these, the joint would be stressed in two directions, both rotationally from the handle movement and also axially as the screw tries to jack itself out of the socket. You may well prefer the look of them without, and the strength of Loctite 603 means they would almost certainly be fine. Anyway, let's get this assembled and see how they look. And there we are. These parts are really unnecessary embellishments. There are any number of ways to produce handles that are considerably more straightforward than this. And to be honest, for the tailstock, the cap screws that were already in there would have been perfectly adequate. That being said, in my opinion, these really do look good, and I am very pleased I took the time to do them this way. With the exception of the holes in the gear and the plunger setting to length, what we have here is the basic head complete. Next time, I'll be making a start on the components required to attach division plates to drive the worm and wheel. So please look out for that if you're interested. Again, do leave any thoughts in the comments. If you do want to see more like this, please do subscribe, and hopefully I'll see you again. Cheerio!